Well, hello, my name is Troy Lanigan. I'm president of the Canada Strong and Free Network and welcome to August exchange call. And I should say, welcome to where the news is made in the last uh, few days of the federal election campaign, the Liberals have landed in some hot water for manipulated media. Um, in fact, I see it still on the front page of the, of the National Post this morning. That media was was manipulated. The manipulated media was taken from an exchange call that uh, Kate Harrison and I uh, hosted last summer during the Tory leadership race when we interviewed uh, Mr. O'Toole and his answer on health care reform was sliced and diced a uh, hundred ways. So uh, to our panelists today, uh, you, just a heads up that you may get more than, than you bargained for today. Hey, first and foremost, uh, we couldn't do these exchange calls uh, without sponsorship. So a very special thank you to our sponsor, Modern Miracle Network. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping matters uh, before we get started in a, in a small announcement. Uh, first of all, we are going to let the chat function run today. The usual reminder that we will remove anyone posting rude or objectionable comments. The chat is for commentary and networking that runs along the side live while we're, we're having the discussion. The Q&A box is for questions exclusively. That's at the bottom of your screen. Our moderator will have a look as we go, as we, the discussion goes on today. So if you have a question, make sure you put it in the Q&A box. It will not be responded to if it goes into the chat box. This Zoom call will be recorded and we'll post it to our website and to our YouTube page uh, two hours after the call. If you have any suggestions on future topics, please connect through our website or email directly, email me directly at troy at canadastrongandfree.network. Uh, I want to mention uh, Canada Strong and Free Network is pleased to announce its regional conference will be, hold, be held this year, October 1st in Red Deer, Alberta. Uh, early bird registration for the one day event is $85 and includes us all sessions, a light breakfast, lunch and post event networking reception. We'll be unveiling speakers and topics uh, over the coming weeks and I'll ask Zoe to put a link um, in the chat right now. Uh, also, one day earlier on October 1st, in conjunction with the Manning Foundation, we'll be hosting our third Manning Best Practices Forum. This event will be available both in person and online. Best Practice Forums are for conservative and free market practitioners. This is uh, discussions around things like uh, fundraising, list building, communication. It's not a discussion of public policy issues. There's no charge for the event, but attendance is by application. Um, also, we have a donor who's generously donated to provide some travel scholarships to this event, and those are available if you email Zoe directly. And Zoe, you please put your um, email in the in the chat as well. Okay, uh, back to the topic at hand. Uh, we have a great uh, panel, and if you're not familiar with any of the folks that are on our panel today, I encourage you to read their bios, and I want to thank them all for participating. All of them are involved with various projects, whether in the media. Uh, True North News, uh, National Post, Sun News, organizations uh, in the movement we've worked as such as Cardus uh, or books. Uh, in fact, Mark Milkey's book, The Victim Cult, was, was a big part of the inspiration for putting this panel discussion together. So uh, please engage and support their work. Um, and I encourage and ask our panelists to drop links in the chat for the benefit of the people um, um, listening today. We also have an elected official, uh, Ellis Ross is an MLA in my home province of British Columbia and is also currently running for leadership of the BC Liberals. I didn't want to say support his work because I, I don't want anyone said that we endorse, we endorse the candidate, we're certainly not. Uh, but I certainly encourage folks uh, to check out his campaign and his uh, social media feeds. He has a great and encouraging story and, and I welcome everyone to check that out. So with that, uh, we are pleased to have our good friend, Brian Lilly. It's uh, always great to have different people come in and uh, moderate these sessions that we do each month. Brian's a great columnist, a commentator. We've had him involved at many events uh, with formerly the Manning Center, now Canada Strong and Free. He's moderating today's discussion. Thank you so much for doing this, Brian, and we'll turn it over to you for the next hour, hour and five minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Troy. And um, I'll, uh, I'll try and keep the discussion moving. We've got some some great panelists lined up. Is everyone able to hear me? It looks like it's still on Troy now as opposed to me. Um, thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, Father D'Souza says he can hear me. So our panelists, as uh, as Troy said, Father Raymond D'Souza, Alice Ross, Mark Milkey, Candace Malcolm, all of whom I've uh, 
except with the exception of Ellis. I haven't dealt much with Ellis. Uh, I've worked with in some way in the past. Now, I'll just set up this um, discussion and, and then we'll start with Mark and, and work our way through the panel. Uh, I'd like uh, about a two minute or so introduction before we get into a back and forth and then answering questions. But the idea of uh, removing our history, decapitating our history. We saw this recently in my hometown of Hamilton, Ontario, the statue of Sir John A. Macdonald that stood in Gore Park for I don't know how many decades uh, simply disappeared. So it was pulled down. It's one of the only ones where I know people have been arrested. We're told that it's to uh, correct historical wrongs. Is that the truth or are we doing something else? In my view, we are importing the American style culture war. This is what I see as a journalist because I, I start reporting on something that happens in the States and the next thing we know, it's happening here. So I'd like to hear from the, the panelists starting with Mark on, on that and, and the idea that this is all being done for, uh, because of what we've been finding out about the, the graves at residential schools and the idea that this is somehow uh, fixing or uh, you know, redoing the, the wrongs of the past. So Mark, we'll, we'll start with your thoughts on this overall topic and then Father D'Souza's next. Sure. One of the reasons I wrote The Victim Cult was because I was greatly concerned about this uh, developing narrative um, that the present owes the past uh, something. Um, this is kind of a dangerous road to go down. What I do in The Victim Cult is I look at cultures and nations around the world. I mean, going back to ancient Rome and then forward. Um, but I, I'd say there are a couple of things wrong with the um, what's called the cancel culture, for lack of a better term. For one thing, when you think about um, those who are no longer with us, it should be obvious that the dead are dead. <clears throat> they can't change their views. And all of us hopefully um, grow in life and change our views when we come into, you know, um, in, into adulthood, when we encounter better arguments, uh, somebody reasons with us, or we meet someone different than ourselves and begin to think about their experiences. So hopefully, you know, you change between 20 and 30 and 30 and 40 and 40 and 50. Um, if you don't, you're probably um, not giving yourself and others the chance to grow and change. But um, to attack historical figures for having views of their era um, makes it, you know, it is, is, is silly. They, they can't change. They're not with us. Um, also, importantly, um, the way, to, the way to judge, I think, historical figures is to ask, to, to understand their era and ask if they contributed to freedom and flourishing in their era. Let me use one example, but there are many. Um, the famous five suffragists, they held views on eugenics that we would uh, rightly despise today. Um, the famous five, though, were in favor of suffrage uh, for women, for the vote for women. Um, do we judge them only by the views we disagree with, or do we say, listen, uh, despite those odious views, they contributed to freedom and flourishing in their era? Or Mahatma Gandhi, who rightly wanted independence um, for India. Uh, nonetheless, Mahatma Gandhi um, wrote to Hitler saying, I don't think you are the monster that you were described, except Hitler was. And Mahatma Gandhi also advised Jews in Germany to work with Hitler. That was mistaken advice, to, say, uh, to put it mildly. Um, nevertheless, Mahatma Gandhi was absolutely right to move forward uh, on Indian independence. So that's the measure we should ask of people. Did they contribute to freedom and flourishing in their own era? And the answer for Winston Churchill or Wilfrid Laurier is yes. The answer for Southern Confederate generals who fought to retain slavery is no. But we should judge them by their era, not ours. And especially because we need some modesty. Future generations may look at us um, and, and wonder why we held some view. Uh, and we also need mo modesty about our ancestral roots, our ancestors, our families, ourselves. Um, there's nobody that, and it, I'm not a big fan of identity politics. However you identify yourself, you know, um, it doesn't make any sense really to hew too closely to one's ancestors 50 years ago or 150 years ago or 5,000 years ago. Um, I mean, the British get a lot of heat these days for being colonialists uh, for a couple of centuries, but they also were the ones along with evangelical Christians that fought to abolish slavery in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, especially the 19th century. And they did so in the Pacific Northwest over the objections of some First Nations involved in the slave trade there. So um, nobody's history is perfect. So the question is, how do you judge the past and how do you judge people? Well, as individuals, 
Thomas Sowell, the black economist, who some of you will be familiar with, said, have we reached the, the point of absurdity where some people are held responsible for things that happened before they were born, while others are not held responsible for things they do today? And I think the answer to Thomas Sowell's rhetorical question is yes, this is the absurdity we've arrived at. Um, and this focus on the past, I think, it's, I think it's a good idea to bring in history. My first love is history. I think it's good to um, widen and, and deepen our understanding of history and other people's history uh, that is different from our own. Um, so I don't think the, the attention on First Nations and history in Canada, a renewed attention to that, a revived attention is a bad idea. I think it's a good idea. But we also then need to make sure as we move forward, we remember what matters. What matters are individuals as individuals, because none of us uh, really, I think, and it's an art, not a science in terms of you know, uh, responsibility for the past, and I can get into that in the Q&A session. But none of us can change this, our skin color. We can't change our ancestry. We can't change where we were born. So uh, how, do you, how do you look at people? You look at them as individuals, because the great evil and fault in human history has been not looking at people as individuals. That's been what causes great evils in history, by saying you're part of this group, uh, and therefore you will suffer. Uh, and, and today, or in, in past eras, because someone's ancestor um, was evil towards one's own ancestor or vice versa. I think that's, um, that's a very dangerous road to trod. And I, I, I point that out in the victim cult in various ways using examples from Rwanda, from Germany between 1800 and 1945, which was enamored with identity politics and cultural purity uh, terms we hear again today. So instead what we should do is remember that it's individuals who matter in law and policy and they should be treated as individuals in law and policy not first as members of some collective. And then second, let's remember that the great, um, I think, debates in history and the most productive debates are those that center around what's a good idea, what's a bad idea, right? John Stuart Mill and Mary Wollstonecraft on, on liberty, on, on the individual. Um, so that's what matters because none of us again can change our color or ancestry, but what we can change is what's inside here, inside our head. And if we focus on individuals and we focus on ideas, two eyes maybe is the best way to think about it. If we focus on what are the best ideas, then we can you know, perhaps give each other some slack. We can again, look at historical figures and say, did they contribute to a better flourishing free culture? Um, and did they have ideas that help propel us forward? And because anybody can change their ideas, anybody can uh, you know, convert from being a theist to an atheist or an atheist to a, a Muslim or someone who's Jewish or Christian or what have you, or uh, a Buddhist. Inside our heads, that's where I think the real battle is. And also, let me end with this. Um, again, a call to modesty, perhaps, looking forward uh, for all of us to remember, regardless of what our views are and regardless of maybe how we've suffered or those related to us have suffered. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the famous Soviet dissident, was put in a gulag after, uh, after making a joke about Stalin. And he suffered tremendously in the gulag. And he became a famous Soviet dissident and abandoned communism as a result of that experience. But Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago wrote this, I think, very insightful comment, um, which I, I profiled in one of the chapters in The Victim Cult. And it has more wisdom than a thousand college seminars could ever hope to produce. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn said this, um, and I paraphrase a little bit, um, but the notion is you look around and you see other people that you think are the problem. And he said, uh, we, we, we are trapped by this notion that if only they were eliminated, they, the, they being the evil people, then all would be well. And he said, that misunderstands human beings. He said, the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. So we ourselves can be the problem. And it's why we need to remember to treat people in law and policy and in their attitudes as individuals and not judge them in advance or in advance for what their ancestors have done or vice versa. And then positively focus on ideas that can bring us forward. And there's a lot of those that frankly, I think need to be appropriated again, to use the term these days uh, by everyone yeah. to move forward. Thank you. All right, Mark, we're gonna hold you there because we gotta get to opening comments from everyone else. And so we'll go next to uh, Father D'Souza who uh, is, um, well, you're a representative of the big bad evil cult in the world right now that's responsible for all of this. This is what I'm hearing in the media. So I'll let you uh, 
uh, take it away on on how you're seeing this as someone who's inside the Catholic Church, which unthinkingly, I believe, many people are um, putting the blame for all the ills of the past. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks for the invitation from uh, to be part of the panel. Uh, I'll just in lieu of your comment, uh, in light of your comment, Brian. I'll just I, I speak for myself. There are lots of Catholic priests and bishops and and faithful in the country. I, I don't speak for them. I speak for myself. I think that um, I would contribute maybe a different starting point, uh, autobiographical starting point. The first time I encountered a statue that had been removed. It was actually quite an exhilarating experience. It was in 1994, I was in Poland. I was asking for directions to go someplace. And uh, the directions were, well, you go take the streetcar and you get off in the, in the square where the statue of Lenin used to be. And I obviously asked, how will I know where the statue of Lenin used to be if it's not there anymore? Uh, but that's how everybody knew that square. The communists had put up a statue and it had been taken down. So. Uh, I think that was a good thing to do. And so not every statue that goes up should remain up. Not every historical judgment that's made uh, by those who are in power at the time uh, needs to be um, sustained by those who come after. I think the answer to our current controversies is uh, probably more history rather than less. And that is to say, let's understand better the figures that are commemorated, whether it's a statue in a park, as you know, Brian, the Sir John A. McDonald statue in the Kingston, his home, his adopted hometown has been removed, or street names or place names or building names. And that is to say that uh, what is the history of these people and what are they being honored for? Mark made a comment about the famous five suffragettes. Um, they're being honored for a particular contribution uh, I think it's just false to think that they're being honored for every possible contribution that they made to public life in their time. I think it's possible to say that uh, a statue of say Sir John A. MacDonald would not be fitting or a school named after him, for example, in, uh, in the middle of an Indian reservation, if in fact that policy, uh, uh, the effect of that policy is felt in a particular way there that can't be uh, put into a context greater than that. But in places where you can look at the whole history of his contribution, I think we need more history rather than less. Uh, more history rather than less. It's not possible to honor historical figures if we insist that every aspect of their public contribution and their private life is, uh, is praiseworthy by today's judgments or by a, a, a widespread consensus. So. Um, we have to be able to, willing to be willing to say that we can honor somebody for something uh, notable uh, without implying we're honoring everything that person did. And, you know, Mark made some historical examples. There are many others. Um, my first time encountering this kind of phenomenon was when I was a student in England and I went, I saw a statue, a bust of Churchill, and I was with an Australian fellow graduate student. And he objected because in Australia, uh, Churchill is associated more, at least in his mind, with the Gallipoli um, disaster of the First World War rather than the Second World War. So maybe it's fitting to have a Churchill statue in, uh, at Westminster, but maybe not at the Australian War College. You know, we have to be able to be open to these kinds of more nuanced considerations. But if we insist that there's only one way to understand certain historical figures, not only does that do damage to our history, uh, but it also actually leaves us with very few people to inspire us because no one will measure up entirely um, to you know, a, a complete uh, uh, praiseworthy standard of today, let alone in the past. So I might say that we can that this discussion can be had a little bit more um, openly in the sense that we don't have to take two polarizing or opposite sides and say there's only two ways to look at this, either uh, the statue stays and everything about that person is vindicated or the statue goes because the one thing about this person uh, represents the sum total of his or her contribution. That's where I would start. 
Okay, and that is a, a different uh, position than we hear in, in most spots. Let's bring on Ellis right now and, uh, and get his uh, perspective on, on where this stands. Ellis, um, you're on the, uh, in that other country we call British Columbia, the other side of the Rockies. It's, uh, it's a different view from where you are in many ways. So give us your opening thoughts. Uh, very much so. And I'm actually on the, the opposite side, uh, per se, in terms of what's going on in Canada, in terms of the Aboriginal issues, which is, uh, you know, I'm watching all across Canada. And the one thing I'll say is that uh, it, it dawned on me uh, not too long ago that Canada is actually eating itself from the inside out. And I'm not sure this is a first world problem or not. But I don't see any other country doing this uh, apart from Canada. And uh, I am an Aboriginal, born and raised on reserve, still live there today. And I am an MLA for uh, Skeena. And yes, I am running for the uh, leader of the BC Liberals. But it's always been interesting to me to, to kind of look at societies all around, around the world today, as well as yesterday. And the one thing I, I thought about was the gut reaction that people have when they're looking at things that happened in the past, including myself. And, and I think what, what we're seeing right now is twofold. One is the gut reaction that you're seeing displayed now in terms of defacing statues or burning churches or tearing down statues. But what I'm seeing as well is a, is a parallel narrative that's being played out as well. In, in one case, you, you're, you're looking at Canada's history as awful, ugly, and uh, we got to fix it. But the parallel history that's being rewritten as well is actually being written with rose tinted glasses. And I'm talking about the Aboriginal history itself. And, and I think this is coinciding with what you're seeing being played out today in, uh, in, in today's news. Give you an example. Uh, I was uh, part of the crowd that actually uh, agreed with my ancestors in terms of the violent history we had. Very violent, including slavery. And when we talked about raiding other people's villages and taking slaves, well, you got to include murder. You have to include stealing. You have to include taking kids and women. And then for a number of different reasons, lots of different reasons. Maybe it's starvation. Maybe it's for power and wealth. Uh, maybe it's for the diversity of your genes in your community. This is all being forgotten now. We used to talk about this with pride 20 years ago. Now we're forgetting about it. Now we're writing a new history of, of Aboriginal culture in BC, whereas we were always being compared to Tibetan monks. And I try to point this out that this is wrong. This is wrong to actually change your history like that. And so I, I, I kind of think, and the other one I'll give you an example of is my own, uh, my own uh, mistakes in terms of gut reactions. I was actually told of a story when I was chair of the treaty uh, table in my community. I was taken to a beach in Victoria. And the elder there told, told us in graphic detail about how every First Nation would bring their low-class woman to these beaches for the construction camps and, and actually basically whore them out and actually use the money to actually throw big feasts back in their community. Well, when these women came back to the community impregnated with European blood and features, the chiefs of the day made a very noble uh, demand. They're saying anybody with a drop of Heisla blood is now Heisla. Very noble. And I was angry about that. I'm still angry about that today. I've never reconciled with that. And, but then I heard an interesting story about a couple months ago by a guy that just loves to dig into the past. And he had a different perspective. He said, you got to remember, smallpox wiped out just about every single community in the west coast of BC. We were literally on the verge of extinction. So the chiefs of the day made a decision. How do we repopulate, knowing that every other community is actually dying out as well, as well as keeping up the diversity of our gene pool? And so it was obvious to them, we've got to go and repopulate with those guys across the channel, the Europeans. I can't tell if this is true or not. I wasn't there. I don't have the context. But I can certainly see uh, human nature, as well as the will to survive, how people might have been thinking back then, because life back then was tough. It was about survival, number one. That was it, just survival. 
Now, in terms of what's going on right now, in terms of uh, statues being burned down, I actually came back from Kamloops and I talked to the chief and council a second time. And I actually agreed with them. They're the, they're the ones that actually, you know, gave me this idea about history being rewritten in the first place. And that was about four years ago. They still stand by today. The residential school that sits beside their council chamber right now is still intact. It's still standing. They use it. But they've added to that history. They've talked about the residential school there. They got a history all laid out, but they're adding to it. Hey, by the way, this is what really happened in terms of Canada's policies. This is what happened in terms of BC's policies, but we're still here, right? And, and they just keep adding to it. The, the, the last thing I'll lead you with is two things is number one, I really think we're doing a disservice uh, to ourselves as Canadians by letting the politicians actually rule the day in terms of looking back in history. And number two, in the age of information, there doesn't seem to be any responsibility in terms of what we're throwing out there right now. It's a great day. It's, it's freaking amazing in terms of technology and the information we're allowed uh, to share. But there's no rules. So this is an open, open playground for politicians to manipulate basically the voter and try to rewrite history for a very short-term cause. That's where I see Canada heading. Thank you. You're on mute, Brian. You're Brian, on mute. I think you're Brian. muted there. Oh. I, I hit the button twice. Sorry. I was saying that uh, we've got a couple of uh, or a lot of great questions going in uh, to the Q&A and we'll get to them shortly. So thanks very much, Ellis. Uh, we'll get to the Q&A questions. And if you've got some, put them in. We'll get to all of them that we can. Uh, but first, we want to hear from Candace Malcolm and her opening thoughts on the, the decapitating of history in Canada. Sure. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you to Troy uh, for organizing this great event and to all the other panelists. I'm honored to be sitting here with everyone. So when, when you see statues torn down in a historical context, you usually think of regime change. You think of Saddam's statues being torn down in Iraq after that government was removed. You, you think of Soviet statues being torn down after the fall of the Berlin Wall. It, when you see it happening in Canada, I, I, I think that we should all pause and just wonder why why it's happening and why no one is stopping it. And I completely agree with Brian's open remarks that we have imported a US style culture war into our country. And you could see you could see it happening, you know, for, for a long time. I think that there was a lot of a grievance in the United States among the progressives and the left over a Trump presidency. It was really traumatic for them. And so all of the sort of things that were in the air, you know, the social justice warriors on campus, the 1619 project, the sort of new woke class of, of demanding absolute conformity, um, it, it really culminated with the death of George Floyd. And it was it was really a moment for Americans, especially on the progressive left, um, to, to, to sort of come to terms with their country, that their country wasn't what they thought it was, that, that they, they think of America as a, as a progressive bastion that elected uh, Barack Obama. All of a sudden, they felt like they were dragged back into the dark ages with Trump. And, and, and you really saw uh, something remarkable, which is the um, excuse, excusing of violence. So, so, so saying, you know, that the, the famous CNN Chiron that said, um, fiery but mostly peaceful protest. And I think that sort of summed up uh, those, those riots in Minneapolis. And, as is the case, you know, whatever's happening in the United States spills into Canada. But but the whole George Floyd issue didn't didn't really work in Canada. Canada doesn't have the same history with regards to slavery. It doesn't have the same uh, demographics, population, and the, the Jim Crow laws uh, that didn't happen in Canada. In fact, in Canada, 52% of the black population is foreign born, meaning they chose to come to Canada. So the idea that that there is institutional racism didn't really hold up, but then, Canada sort of had its own George Floyd moment this summer, this spring, when the Tecumloops band came forward with their findings of uh, what they called unmarked graves that were discovered on their reserve. And what happened uh, fr from my perspective is that the media narrative really, really, really got away from the facts. So I, I covered this story. I watched it very, very closely. I tried to uncover exactly what the facts were, what was known and what wasn't. And what I saw was that the media narrative really ran away from the facts. I wrote a piece for TNC News, which is my uh, digital media startup. Um, the, the website's called TNC News, we call it True North. 
and it was called Six Things the Media Got Wrong About the um, un Unmarked Graves Found in Tecum Loops. And the story went absolutely viral from our perspective. I think it got a couple of hundred thousand views, which is really, really good for a small little digital media report. But all I did was, was sort of go through the, the facts of the story. And I, I can go into that in, in some detail, uh, Brian, if you'd like, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say that to me, the, the most uh, egregious one of them all was the idea that what was discovered were mass graves. The mass, a mass grave is a hallmark of genocide. Mass grave goes hand in hand with mass murder. And so if we're gonna use this term mass grave, it's, it's used intentionally to stir up images of the Holocaust, of the, the horrific evils that were done across Europe in the 20th century, not just across Europe, because it happened in Cambodia as well, it happened in Rwanda. But, 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 but the idea of a mass grave means something very specific. And, and the, the word genocide means something very specific. It, it, importantly, it requires intent. And so I think that the blurring of the lines, the blurring of the facts, the fact that the media wasn't really reporting on the facts on the ground, or if they were, they were burying it deep into a story that, that wasn't what mattered. What mattered was this narrative, this narrative that Canada's evil, Canada committed genocide, Canada's history is just as awful as every other country in the world. And therefore we, we don't deserve this place uh, that we hold where we see ourselves as a beacon of hope and liberty and opportunity. And we have no right to be a, um, a moral guidance in, in the world. Um, it, to, to me, it, it was intentional. It was picking up on this American zeitgeist of the, the sort of woke destruction of Western civilization, saying that Western civilization is no better um, than any other civilization. So uh, of course there were not mass graves that were discovered in these residential schools. They were individual graves. The, the technology that was used was very rudimentary. So any specific number of graves that you may have heard in a news report is not accurate. It's, it's, it's a rough guess. Uh, if, if you go into the reporting of some of the reserves, not to Kamloops, but the Coessis Reserve in Saskatchewan and the Lower Kootenai Reserve in Cranbrook, uh, both of those stories um, were focused on existing graveyards. So, so we're not talking about uh, undiscovered graves at a residential school. We're talking about existing graveyards in the case of Cranbrook and Lower Kootenai, the, the, the cemetery actually predates the residential school by about 50 years, and it was also used by the local hospital. So, so, so we're not just talking about First Nations children that were buried there, we're talking about the broader com community. We're not just talking about children, we're talking about adults. Uh, I think it was mentioned before the cause of death. You know, We're not talking about firing squads and, and, and gas chambers like the Nazi Germany example that, that is so often equivalented with. You know, We're talking about death from horrible diseases. And, and that's also wrong. Um, but you know, for me as a journalist, uh, truth does matter. And so none of this is to say that residential schools were okay. They were, they were not, there were bad policy, horrible policy to, you know, taking children away from their parents is, is something that we can look back now and understand how shameful and awful that is. And, and so uh, to me, the important thing is that we remember the facts and that we don't let the narrative go to this place where we just shrug our shoulders and admit, yes, Canada admitted, uh, committed genocide. Because once we hit that point, I think we get to a very dangerous place in our country and our society. It's hard to defend Canada. It's hard to say, no, we shouldn't tear down these statues. No, we shouldn't burn down these churches when we're resting it on that, on that idea that Canada is something truly evil, which I don't think that we did. So I think that the best way to defend Canada, defend ourselves from this movement that's happening, this, this, this woke zeitgeist, I call it, um, is, is, is to use facts to, to use reason and, and to come up with a solution going forward, not just to dwell on what happened in the past, but to say, okay, what can we do today? What can we do now um, to help make sure that all Canadians have the same standard of living, the same level of freedom and opportunity. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right, thank, thanks very much, Candice. And um, it's interesting that uh, your reporting on that was far closer to what the, the leadership in Kamloops and Cowessis and elsewhere had actually said than what we heard on uh, nightly TV newscasts and and elsewhere because it was uh, so vastly different in terms of what was reported. Uh, I remember Cowess is saying that they were working well with the Oblates, uh, the order of Catholic priests to to get the church records, and, and yet the um, uh, reporting said otherwise. Uh, in in Kamloops is where we first heard the term mark, uh, mass graves, and yet that's not something that the band actually said. So. It, it was um, a bit bit of shameful reporting by uh, some of my media colleagues. Some great questions in here. I just want to uh, start with um, 
uh, one from Ian Brody and uh, uh, whoever wants to jump in and respond, I'll let you do that. Uh, Ian writes, Mark's emphasis is on the individuals and the internal life, but isn't the argument from the activist a different one, that it's the systems that matter and we need to reform systems in order to achieve equality, that capitalism, whiteness, and other institutions systematically disadvantage people as individual members of a group. I think that is a, a fundamental difference is Mark's talking about individuals and judging people as individuals, treating each other as in, individuals. It's always a discussion of community groups and uh, um, systems. Are we talking past each other, Mark, or does anybody else want to jump in on this? No, I, I don't think we are, but I think what needs, people need to define what they mean. So we hear a lot about systemic racism these days, and you'll see when that comes up, often people will use examples of individual prejudice. Let's be clear, there's a difference between what's called systemic or institutional racism and the prejudice of an individual. The latter is really difficult because uh, it's hard to change human hearts. The former though, institutional discrimination. I think facts matter, as Thomas Sowell once said. Um, if, you, if you look at institutional discrimination in Ontario, go back to the 1950s, discrimination on the basis of race um, in the workplace, in government, and the public was outlawed in 1951. And in 1954, they added to it with banning discrimination based on, again, race and gender and the rest of it and ethnicity uh, in lodging in 1954. Um, this has been the law of the land, at least in that province, for almost 70 years. That was institutional discrimination. So let's be clear about what we're talking about. This is why I and some others try and get to apple to apple examples. So one of the things I did in the book is I said, okay, let's also look at um, you know, comparisons between say indigenous Canadians, young adults, 25 to 34, they've got a university degree with non-indigenous Canadians. If you've got a bachelor's degree or higher as an indigenous Canadian, you actually earn $100 more than a non-Indigenous Canadians. So why is that? Because you've got the education, you're likely in an urban location, whereas a majority, a good chunk of First Nations people are not relative to the entire population. So I think you have to get into specifics when these sorts of uh, notions come up. And lastly, I would say this as well, this notion, um, systems are sometimes a problem, but if you don't fix, uh, if the notion is you have to fix this grand system behind you before you can progress, think about what that does to people. It says, you can't succeed until what people claim is this uh, system fix happens. Um, this was not, for example, the approach of Asian Americans and Asian Canadians in the most discriminatory period in Canadian and American history in the 1910s and the 1920s. And they said, we're sending our kids to schools, we're sending them to university. And one of the things I found out when I researched the book, and it's in the book uh, very briefly, is that they were sending their kids to high school and college at rates much higher than white Americans by 1920 and 1930. And why does that matter? Because it set the foundation for success, and they did so. They refused to be trapped by white racists of the era. Um, so they did what they could. Now, the systemic racism of the era was wrong, but they refused to you know, use systemic racism of that era as an excuse not to move forward. It would have been, um, it would have been disastrous. Anybody want to jump in on that? If not, I've got a, another question I'd like to get to, to hear from people. Sure, Brian. Uh, systemic racism. Uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, yeah, definitely, without a doubt. Today, hard to find it. Uh, you know, the provincial government here in BC was quick to jump on an incident that happened in my writing and, you know, referred to uh, the healthcare system as systemic racism. And so I looked into the one incident that actually made the news all across Canada, and I tried to find where the systemic racism was, and I couldn't find it. Mind you, it was, it was so personal in nature, as well as the, it's because of its medical information, I couldn't get the exact facts in terms of the incident itself. But I could look at the policies that, that actually were, were created all around this type of an incident, and I couldn't find the, the, the systemic racism. In fact, if anything, I found the opposite. How could you develop a file so vast and so intricate and document every single step of, of an incident over a nine month period, and then claim at the very end of it, that's racist. I couldn't find it. And the, the doctors and nurses I talked to, you know, they're telling me, you're on it, you got the answer, you're just about there, just keep going, but I can't give you the, the answer itself because it's confidential. This is information. This is control of information. 
And so with, without that key piece of data, you know, we're allowing politicians to say, well, that's why it's systemic racism. And then the last thing I told the legislature and saying, look, if we're talking about the healthcare system being systemic racism, that means us as legislatures, we're racist because we're the ones that set the rules for the, the healthcare system in BC. And I'm not racist. I don't know any of my colleagues are racist. I don't even think there's any, anybody on the government side that's racist. So this idea of systemic racism, it's a, great, it's a great word, it's a great term. It captures the attention of people, but it's not accurate because it's politics. The, um, there's a lot of focus, of course, on uh, tearing down of statues of Sir John A. Macdonald. Gabriel points out that uh, Sir John A. Macdonald was not a, a perfect man, far from it, but he still steered those to the creation of the country, the nation state of Canada. So he asked, uh, or Gabriel asked, how much of this is a result of a general ignorance of our history? I, I think that's a big part of it. I'll add to this and, and, and ask the panelists for comment. Um, I also think it, there's a general ignorance of our history, but among the people that are actually doing this, I think it's a targeting of our history because there's never an attempt to pull down uh, a Wilfrid Laurier statue or say the Shadow Laurier must be renamed or the liberal fundraising club, the Laurier Club has to be renamed. Wilfrid Laurier um, drew the residential school system. He signed an executive order banning uh, black immigration to Canada, Indian immigration to Canada, increased the Chinese head tax. To me, it's not just a maybe a general ignorance of history among the general population, but a targeting of our history by the activists that want to uh, perpetuate and, and bring about the, the decapitating of our history. What, what do the panelists think on that? Yeah, that's absolutely right, Brian. I mean, it's it's a selective um, ignorance of history, and we never see it, it, there's a partisan element to it. I, I I think it's a little bit more nuanced though, because I'll give you an example. I grew up in British Columbia. I have a lot of First Nations friends, just where I grew up, and I was very aware of the residential school program. We had a, a, a former student from the the residential schools come and speak at my high school, and it was uh, really. Sorry if, if I'm cutting out a little. It, it, it was a very emotional experience, and uh, I, I, that was part of my education. And I think that this latest round of the discovery of the of the graves at the residential school um, stirred a big spark because a lot of people genuinely just didn't know about this part of our history. They really weren't aware. They didn't know that this had happened in Canada. And, and like I said in my opening remarks, it, was, it wasn't a good policy. It was a very, very bad policy. Taking children from their parents is a bad idea, and, and that should have never happened. Um, but I, th I think that if more Canadians were aware of this part of our history, that, that the reaction wouldn't have been um, so over the top and so permissive of the violence that we did see. So I, I think that, that, that the answer is a, is a bit mixed on that one from my perspective. Anyone else want to jump in on that one? You got to remind me, Brian. What what, what was the statement? What was the this topic? Well, it, that uh, it that the taking down of the statues in this movement is driven by a uh, an ignorance of our history, and I I think there's also a, among the activists a a political targeting of our history. So that's what I was asking uh, the, the panelists what they thought on that. Oh, without without a doubt. In fact, very selective. And, and you know, it's, it's almost in terms of uh, pre-contact and contact, that's being written, written as well. And then I, I try to talk about this as much as I can and try to keep an unbiased uh, you know, position. I just look at kind of like some of the, the documentation that was actually, that's in place right now. And so the idea of colonialism, for example, and settlers, everything's bad. Oh, it destroyed away of life. Well, they seem to forget that on the West Coast of BC, when, when uh, the, the, the First Nations first met the explorers. They wanted those glass beads. They wanted that steel. They wanted it. And they, they actually made it, uh, what I would amount today, would be an unfair trade. They, they, they gave like seven huge spring salmon for a little chunk of steel and a few glass beads. Well, it, it, it's not really right for us to say, well, that was an unfair trade. And that, that just goes to show you how it was raped. They wanted it badly. And then when you look at it, as, as we actually grew up together, the, the explorers, the colonists, the, the, the natives, 
everything that the, 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 the settlers brought is what the natives wanted. They wanted stick-built houses. They wanted cars, radios, TVs. They didn't want to live anymore in longhouses with a bunch of other families because, let's face it, life was tough. It was really tough. Surviving is tough. And I've actually gone out to challenge people and say, okay, you really think of that about colonialists? Go out there, kill a deer, skin it, make some clothes for yourself. And by the way, make, make your tools out of natural materials as well. You know, and use stone because you didn't have steel. In that context, think about the, the luxuries that you want to give up for your political cause. And it, this is what happens when you kind of rewrite history with today's lens. You can't do it. It's impossible. And by the way, the, the history that we're talking about today is pretty pale in comparison to the reality. And I think people would understand, you know, how ugly our history could really be if we were really truth about it from all angles. If um, so, I'd, I'd like to hear a bit more, both from Alice, but Mark and Father D'Souza as well on this. It, there is a, a move among some saying, well, if we're not going to take a statue down, put up a plaque telling more of the history. Do we need to tell more of our history on all sides? Alice has talked about the violent nature of the history of his own people on the west coast of, of British Columbia. I know that I grew up in um, a, a territory that if we were doing land acknowledgements, I don't know who the politician would uh, say the land was the traditional territory of because I grew up right near the Oshwekin Reserve, uh, Six Nations Reserve near Brantford, but the, the land in Hamilton was actually uh, the land of the neutral who were wiped out in wars between uh, and, and weakened even before. The arrival of Europeans. So, uh, you know, if, if we look at the full history, uh, as Mark said, you know, everybody has something dark in their past. Uh, if we look at it as groups, but we do we need to tell that full history instead of um, giving a rose-colored glasses view, so that we also we understand each other better. Brian, I would also say add the positive in. Remember the positive, and that's what's missing, perhaps today. The nuance it's missing from history. So uh, Father D'Souza had mentioned this a moment ago, you know, we need more history, not less. And I, I agree with that. Let me give you an example from British Columbia in the late 1850s. There was a group of 35 black Californians that moved to Victoria um, to escape the discrimination, right? Uh, Post-Civil War, there began, to be, began, there began to be more and more prejudice in other parts of the country against black Americans. And so this group of 35 moved to Victoria. They actually found a welcoming reception in Governor James Douglas in the local Anglican priest. Um, they were allowed after nine months um, to run for office after seven years to become citizens um, of British Columbia or the, the colony back then in the late 1850s and the early 1960s. They were followed up by, uh, in total, just over 400 black Americans uh, because as Victorians normally do or adopted Victorians, they brag about the weather, um, you know, and say how wonderful it is there. But, um, you know, people forget this. And, and so there's this weird sort of... Um, you know, again, very um, sh shortened history where, where people, you know, get into these categories of good and evil only and nuance is lost. And look, uh, the problem after, say, the 1860s in British Columbia in the 1870s was that as, as some more American, not to pick on the Americans, but, you know, the reality was there was some more Im American immigration that was not black that added to some prejudices of the era in uh, what became British Columbia. But initially, um, these black American arrivals from California were quite welcomed by J James Douglas, the governor of the day, and, and the local Anglican minister. And uh, both of those gentlemen fought against local prejudice. I'm not saying prejudice didn't exist in that era. I'm sure it did. Um, but I think we need to remember all parts of that history as well. So uh, that's uh, an important bit of historical uh, remembrance uh, as well. Thanks, Brian. Uh, that's from Father. Yeah, I would. Go ahead, Raymond. Thank you. Uh, your point about selectivity, Brian, is a good one. Um, if you're going to go looking around in the history of Canada or in the history of any country or the history of the Indigenous peoples or the history of any peoples, you're going to find lights and shadows. Uh, but if you decide that you're only going to look for the shadows in certain people and only the lights in other people, then you set up a political dynamic. And uh, perhaps today, the those in power uh, or those with influence, might better to say, not, not about being in office, uh, prevail, but, you know, down the road, that can turn and change. And we've already seen that sometimes um, people who are, consider themselves very progressive, can sometimes find themselves quickly 
out of favor, let alone with uh, conservatives. So more history rather than less. In Kingston, you know, uh, Richard Gwynn, late Richard Gwynn, launched both of his, his two volumes on John A. Macdonald in this city. Uh, he was by no means whitewashing. You know, he was very open about the flaws in John A. Macdonald's policy and in his personal character, uh, but came to a positive judgment. A similarly fair-minded observer would probably come to the same on Wilfrid Laurier or, or another. But if you don't, if you engage only in a kind of a selective reading of history that only partisan conservatives are bad in history and partisan liberals are good in history, uh, what you end up doing very much is you become to, you, you set up a dynamic where the country, the institution, the city, the province or whatever uh, becomes a political construction. It's about politics. And so it becomes less able for there to be a shared loyalty or what we call patriotism uh, towards that country and that it fractures the unity of that place. Uh, and I think that's actually a, uh, a danger that we've already seen. Uh, and in a country, especially like Canada, which has people from all over the world here, we shouldn't be sanguine about uh, calling into question uh, loyalty or patriotism to the country because the unity of the country is not something that can be taken for granted. It has to be worked at in every generation. The um, a general theme is um, what's the point of this? Uh, who's doing this? The decapitating, diminishing, vilifying of our past. Um, I, I want to pick take that and then pick up on something that Candace mentioned and uh, in, in here from the panelists, can you even defend Canada anymore? Um, the way that some people are talking, including our prime minister at times, uh, with his uh, eagerness okay. to jump on Canada being a genocidal state, but you know, taking days to condemn the Taliban. I don't want to get too partisan, but there is a, a section of our society that no longer thinks Canada is a defensible place. Can you defend Canada or have too many of uh, our, our, our fellow countrymen and women just decided this place is all evil in the past and, and not something that we can support or defend anymore. Well, uh, Brian, I would say on that point, um, and this is not a partisan point, but uh, the current liberal government and its predecessor government cannot really believe that um, the country is a criminal enterprise or is uh, irredeemably corrupt because every year they set immigration targets that are larger than the year before and they have no trouble meeting them or lament when they don't. Uh, so we go out into the world daily, all our embassies and consulates and propose that Canada is a good place to live. Um, we don't have trouble making that argument. A lot of people wanna come here because they see the opportunities. Um, if the standard is that Canada should be measured against a country without flaws, obviously Canada will come, uh, come up short. But if the question is, is Canada on balance a better place for opportunity, flourishing, liberty, peace than other places, that argument is made by our current government and made by all the people who apply to come here. So uh, I think that's a, that's a rhetorical sleight of hand. And I think amongst the vast majority of Canadians, those who are recent immigrants and those who've been here many generations, um, there's a very widespread consensus that this is a good country uh, with flaws that is able to admit its flaws. But the point of view that you characterize, while influential, I don't think is, um, is very numerous, but it is influential. Who else wants to jump in on that one? Sure, Brian. Uh, I, I tried to defend Canada, uh, especially in the leadership campaign, talking about how great this country is, especially when you compare what's happening in Afghanistan today and what's going to happen to those poor people, especially the women and children in that place. Canada is still a great place. Uh, in terms of defending Canada, though, uh, right or wrong, white conservative males cannot defend Canada. That's just because of the politics. And you, you know, we saw it in, in terms of what was happening there in terms of Canada Day. Immigrants, newly landed immigrants were praising Canada, but that didn't make the news. It didn't, it actually didn't get widespread, but they were saying, you, this is a great country. This is why we came here. It's great freedoms, great opportunity. That didn't gra grab national headlines. So I think that yes, we can defend Canada, uh, 
but just because of the politics. Uh, and by the way, full disclosure, uh, I am a federal conservative member. I, I joined a couple of years ago, mainly because for two reasons. Number one, it's not well known what federal conservatives did for uh, helping the independence of First Nations of Canada with their programs. I appreciated that as a chief counselor of my own band, as well as being a counselor. And number two, given the circumstances we're facing today, I actually really appreciate the fiscal responsibility that conservatives had. Those are the only two reasons I joined. And I want to see the leadership race from the inside out. But in terms of defending Canada, yeah, I, I don't think white conservatives can do it, especially male white conservatives. And that's just the nature of politics that we're facing. Sorry, Mark. That's what we're facing yeah. today in terms of politics. I, I, I take your point. But um, nonetheless, I think truth has to stand on its own. Look, I think part of the problem we're dealing with is also that in the 20th century, the ideologies of the 20th century were about utopianism as applied to the future, right? That was, you know, uh, Marxism. Let's create this utopia. We're in this weird situation in the 21st century where people look back and expect the past to have been perfect. Uh, they've got utopian thinking as applied to the past, which of course um, doesn't work because human beings are imperfect. Um, you know, Father Raymond D'Souza can talk about uh, that more than I can as a theologian, but that's the reality of people. Um, I would say this, I do think Canada can be celebrated and should be celebrated. And the problem in the past was not for the most part, I'd say the ideals. The ideals of classical liberalism that came out of the enlightenment um, that were popular in the 19th century and the 20th century, even under Pierre Trudeau, this notion of the individual, treat the individual as an individual. Um, the problem was not with the ideal of free individuals or free economies. The problem was with um, the discrimination of uh, against individuals of indigenous ancestry in Canada. They couldn't vote until 1960. So the problem was not with the ideal of, of a free society. It was that it wasn't allowed and permitted um, to everyone in Canada as an individual. That was the problem. But the ideals of a free society are uh, laudable and should be pursued. I, I'll just add, I think that, you know, every, everything to be said has probably been said by the, the other panelists who are, are more insightful than I, but I, I just go back to this idea of systemic racism. The part of the reason why it's used is because it's impossible to define, it's impossible to understand. We all know what a racist looks like. We can all join together, point to someone who's racist or a racist idea, racist policy, and condemn it and work together. But when you, when you talk about this sort of cloud of systemic racism or institutional racism, it's murky, there's a lack of definition and, and it's intentional because if there's anything specific, we'll address it. But there's nothing specific, it's just sort of the idea that, that there's an inequality of outcome. And so it makes it a lot harder to address. And, and as long as that is there, you know, the, the very idea is, is to tear apart the underpinnings of our society, to go back to Mark's point, and, and, and replace it with some utopian idea that's never been tested and never been tried. So as, as far as you know, the real world, it, Canada is imperfect, but relative to the rest of the world, relative to every other form of government out there that's been tried, Canada's a pretty, a heck of a good job. And, and you're right, immigration is, is, is a sign of that. I think that where we are as, as conservatives or classical liberals or, or just patriotic Canadians, uh, we have a challenge right now in that we have to come up with a new way of understanding our country. What, what, what is Canada? What, what are we here for? What's the point? What is the purpose? What can we do that is different? And I think that now is a good time for conservatives to get together and start proposing uh, you know, a new ideal of Canada that, that's maybe more realistic, that's not built on totally aspirational ideas that, that do blur out the past and, and ignore some of the ugly chapters of our history. But you know, in, in, instead of relying on the sort of big L liberal vision of Canada as a kinder, more progressive, more liberal version of America, which doesn't really stand up to the test of history, I think that, that the, the challenge and the onus is on, on our side uh, to come up with a better way of explaining Canada, of looking into the future and saying, what, what is Canada, what is the Canadian experiment about? What do we want Canada to do uh, and look like 100 years from now, 200 years from now? And I think that this is a great opportunity to have that conversation and to get the ball, ball rolling on that. I get people Brian. building a, a new view. I, I, I think you're right. Sorry, was somebody trying to jump in there? Yeah, Brian, I would, I would say, you know, one of the I think interesting points to Candace's point about maybe what political conservatives could do, but more broadly is that, um, especially in regard to Indigenous Canadians, one of the uh, tragedies um, of Canadian history is that a land of opportunity for people who came here from elsewhere uh, 
it was often denied to the people who were here uh, originally, aboriginally, uh, in Indigenous Canadians. Um, for example, it was the Diefenbaker immigration reforms got away from thinking of people in terms of classes, so from white nations, et cetera, and brought in what we what we used to call the point system to evaluate people, to make it easier for people from non-favored races to come to this country. Uh, that was also the Diefenbaker government that extended the vote to uh, Aboriginal Canadians. Those were, that was a conservative government, a prairie government. Um, and that really is the best of Canada, is trying to include people in circles of opportunity. One of the tragedies even today is that someone who arrives here from another country has probably a better chance of starting a business and owning a home than some of our Aboriginal uh, Indigenous Canadians who are restricted by a kind of a paternalism that has been in the Canadian law for a long time to do those very things. So there is, I think, an opportunity agenda, a, a way to look at people who have uh, unleashed their creativity and opportunity. And if we look at our history and say, look, a lot of people have come from around the world to take advantage of this. If our own Indigenous people are not able to do that in the same way, that is, and we don't have to be afraid to use the term a system, systemic or systematic problem uh, that can be addressed in our public uh, policy. And that is an argument that could be favored by political progressives or as it has been in history by political conservatives. We'll see if, uh... If any of this does come out in the campaign trail, I was going to try and squeeze in one more, but I think that we are uh, are pushing the envelope already with it, it being just after one o'clock now. We want to be respectful of people's time. Uh, hopefully you can, uh, um, as Troy suggested earlier, check out each of the panelists if you don't know them or check out myself and, and get to know uh, everyone's respective work and support that and consider ways that uh, we can move forward. I think that the points brought up by uh, by Candace at the end of finding a positive way to, to do this, by uh, Raymond about finding a positive way to move forward, I think are uh, some of the best of what we heard today. We all know the problems of the past. We can disagree with the progressives that want to tear everything down. What's the positive answer going forward? With that, I will hand it back to, uh, to Troy. Hey, thank you, uh, Brian, and thank you to all the panelists. That was just uh, just an exceptional discussion. Um, again, this exchange call will be posted uh, to our website and to our YouTube page inside the next two hours. Uh, again, a special thank you to our sponsor today, the Modern Miracle Network. But we are the Canada Strong and Free Network. If you appreciate and value the work that we do, please uh, consider a donation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you at the next exchange call. Bye for now.